If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump, look, uh, I'm still on quarantine. This is, uh, we probably have one or two more episodes like this. So I'm calling in while Adam and Justin and Doug are in the studio, but we're still delivering the best fitness podcast in the world. And today's episode, we decided to tackle the seven biggest male fitness myths. Now we've done the female fitness myths. In fact, that's one of our most popular episodes of all time, but I can't believe we've never actually tackled the fitness myths that men fall for. So luckily for you, we did it today. So we talk about the biggest myths that men tend to fall for, like uh, you need to lift heavy to get big. That's one of them. Uh, Train to failure is necessary. Intensity is king. You need to eat big to get big. Steroids guarantees muscle. The biggest guys in the gym know the most. And, you know, some movements are for women and they have no benefit for men. So we tackle those things in this episode and we talk about the truths around them, like what really does work because those myths are all totally false. Now, this episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Everly Well. Now, you might have heard of Everly Well in the news recently. Uh, they're one of the first private companies to make a COVID-19 test. Now, it's not available to everyone. It's just for frontline healthcare workers, but we love this company. They are definitely on the cutting edge and they provide at home hormone tests for everybody. Okay. So if you're a guy and you want to test your testosterone level, or if you're a woman and you want to see what your estrogen and progesterone levels are, or if you want to test your stress hormones, you can get all of these tests without a prescription delivered to your door for very, very low cost. Now, one of the best ways to use these tests, in our opinion, is to test yourself throughout the year. So if you're a guy, um, you could test your testosterone three to four times a year and see how your workouts, your sleep and your diet are affecting the most anabolic uh, muscle building hormone in your system. So Everly Well is one of our sponsors. They are sponsoring this episode. And because you're a Mind Pump listener, you get 25% off. Here's how you get that discount. Go to everlywell.com. That's E V E R L Y W E L L.com. Use the code Mind Pump and you'll get 25% off any of their tests. Also, 48 hours left for our Maps Anywhere 50% off sale. You only have two days left. Now, Maps Anywhere is an at home workout program that requires very minimal equipment. All you need are exercise bands, so resistance bands a broomstick or a PVC pipe, uh, and a pull-up bar. And that's it. You get a phenomenal workout without a gym. And most gyms are closed right now. We know that's happening. You're, you're at home. You don't know what to do. Follow this program and get the best results you've ever had. This is a very, very effective program. It's a very popular program. And again, it's 50% off. Here's how you get the half-off discount before the sale ends. Go to Maps White. Dot com that's m a p s w h i t e dot com and use the code white fifty that's w h i t e five zero no space for the discount. One of our early episodes that we did a while ago, well, geez, when we first started, and then we did another episode that was similar to it, got lots and lots of traction. In fact, it was one of our first like big downloaded uh, podcast episodes. I it was like number three, it. right? Yeah, yeah it was, it, no, it was the first episode. It was the first one. Yeah, yeah, no. Female Fitness Myths was one of the most popular episodes, so popular that I remember about two or three years later, we redid it again. And the irony of this, and we were the four of us were talking today, was that we did that for female fitness myths twice. Yeah, and we never did it for men. And we never addressed the big myths for men. And I think that's a, a, a really cool topic that I don't think a lot of people talk about because I think uh, most guys that go to the gym seem to think they know it all, uh, yes, which is it, why it, I think we should do this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Let's no, call you well, out, bro. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I mean, you know, I fell for a, a lot of myths um, oh. around training and there was the there were the myths that were 
directed towards um, towards men. You know, we're, we're men are just as susceptible to you know the some of the misinformation and lies that come out of the the fitness space. Now, the, the myths that that uh, you know tended to be directed towards women were designed to to kind of get women to work out and to make them not afraid of weights and you know stuff like that. The ones that tend to be directed to men tend to be driven by this like macho kill yourself at all costs uh, type of drive. Um, and, you know, we, we, we succumb to it because, you know, we think, you know, uh, more is better, harder is better. And I, I find that a lot of the myths around training for men kind of revolve around that attitude, you know? Um, and like I said, I fell for every single one that I could think of. I think that's so important to note when we go through these two, this is the not, uh, the three of us piling on all the the bros or the guys in the gym, and this is not to hate on people. It's literally I, everything that we sat down when we were taking the notes on this. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, I did that one. Right. Oh yeah. So I, I I think it's coming from a place of compassion and and hopefully saving a, a lot of time uh, and years potentially off of uh, some of your your training because I wish somebody would have shared this information with me when I was 20 years old. So I didn't spend uh, years and years of spinning my wheels on, on a lot of these points. Totally. And, and uh, you know, why do we want to cover these? Well, we're covering the myths that are considered um, common knowledge that are considered truths. Cause there's a lot of lies uh, that are, you know, spouted by people in, in the fitness space. Um, but there's only a few of them that are almost like not challenged. Like they're, they're considered to be, truths yeah and so those are the ones that we're we're going to tackle in this episode mm -hmm. and it's important to tackle them because the following myths uh not only will prevent you from progressing but because they're believed to be so true if you do what i did which is just hard-headedly stick to them because i thought that they were the truth you can cause yourself to go backwards hurt yourself uh, you, you know cause injuries mm -hmm. um and maybe even think that you just weren't made for this because you know it's it's not working for you. When you say that too, it it makes me kind of like unpack and think about like the differences between the myths for women and the myths for men. And it almost seems like uh, I felt like the women's myths that we did were like just blatant lies and terrible or made up yeah. words, just fucking lies completely. Mm -hmm. With the men, a lot of the myths are rooted in truth, and I think that's what also makes them so tough. And, and why so many people still fall on it. Like, for example, like the very first one that comes to mind is like, you must live heavy to get big. Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah. there's some truth to that, right? There's, I mean, if you lift heavy, uh, it's going to stimulate muscle growth. But I, and, and this one's near and dear to me because uh, this was one of the first, like, bit, like the first bit of any science I applied to my training was I read an article that, you know, said that if you wanted to grow and, and, and build, massive arms I, I i needed to lift in the six rep range mm -hmm. uh and lower it was not uh it was in and higher rep ranges were for toning or uh, lean lean muscles and at that time i was a very skinny kid so anything in the lean direction did not sound appealing to me i wanted to grow i wanted to get big and therefore i spent uh several years lifting in the you know four to six rep range forever and your body stalled. I did the same thing. You know, I, I, and, and, and part of this, you know, uh, was fueled by the, my machismo. I mm -hmm. wanted to be strong. So I'm, I'm going to push as much weight as possible. I sacrificed form. Um, I sacrificed range of motion, both of which are directly connected to building muscle, your form and your range of motion both have a major impact on how much muscle you can build. But if you believe that you have to lift heavy to get big, the first the, the first two things that are going to go out the window yeah. if you live and die by that is form. your form right. and your range of motion. Yeah, you're, you're not, go I, ahead. I totally uh, remember vividly. It, it's a competitive thing, right? It's this ego thing already established when you're around a bunch of other guys and, and you're lifting weights. And you, you want to tackle it just like you're – you're competing like you're you want to one up the, the guy next to you. And it's just something that uh, a lot of guys share that sort of sentiment as they go into the gym and they're working out. Uh, they want to kind of compare themselves uh, to everybody else in the gym. 
And what they see somebody else lifting may be way out of reach for them initially, but it's something you can ramp up to. And there's a really smart way to attack that process. So there is some truth in lifting heavier weights, but the way that uh, a lot of guys initially tackle that is, is way off, if not detrimental to them progressing forward. Yeah. The, the reality is uh, all rep ranges um, build muscle. All of them do every single one of them up into maybe 30 reps even, which is pretty damn high, all of them will build muscle. It's really more about the type of tension that you place on the muscle and whether or not the rep range or the exercise is the right stimulus for your body. So what I mean by that is if, if, I'm, if I only ever always train with heavy rate and low reps, the second I move to lighter weight and higher reps, it's a brand new stimulus and my body's going to respond tremendously. Oh, this this was my this was my biggest gains. My biggest gains in my twenties came from this exact point you're making right now because I had already been on that two to three years in a row of lifting at six rep range, and I do I remember this too. This was advice from a trainer, some trainer at the at this local gym that I was at, and he was jacked, and so I asked him, you know how you know how I build muscle, and he asked me about what I was doing. And he told me to lift uh, lightweight, 15, 20 reps. And I thought he was crazy. And he said, trust me, just do it. And I did. And I grew like I hadn't grown in since the previous two or three years. And it blew my mind, completely shattered my paradigm. Yeah, same thing happened to me. I was, uh, you know, I started training real young at 14. And, you know, of course, like I said, I, I believed that you have to lift heavy to get big. I thought that was the rule of all rules. And, you know, two years after lifting, you know, I'd made some gains, you know, I'm a, I'm a teenage boy, I'm feeding my body like crazy and I'm, I'm do I'm, I'm still consistent. Um, but I just wasn't progressing very quickly. I was, it was a real slow grind. I thought I was a, a, a super hard gainer. Then I bought a, a, a flex mag. I used to read all the, all the bodybuilding magazines and there was an article in there about, uh, Serge Nubray. I don't know if you guys know who he is. But he was a uh, bodybuilder who was uh, very competitive in the 70s. In fact, if you watch Pumping Iron, um, Serge Nebre takes, uh, I think, third, second place to Arnold Schwarzenegger in the 1974 Mr. Olympia. He's, you know, well known for having one of the most aesthetic physiques of all time. And I read his routine and this guy was training in the like 15 rep range, just, just, just these higher reps. And I thought, oh, you know, let me give this a shot. I've been working out long enough at this point to be pretty frustrated. And so what I did was is I lowered the weight. Instinctually, I, I went deeper with my range of motion um, and I focused on the muscle. This just happened instinctually, right? Because I can go because I'm going lighter, I can have a, a better range of motion. And just like you, Adam, it was the fastest change my body had seen ever since the very beginning of when I started working out. Now, of course... If I had stuck with that rep range for the rest of my life, I would have also seen my gains come to a grinding halt. Well, didn't it? Didn't I mean? Didn't you do that? That's what I did. I mean, I, I this because I'm still young and naive at this point. I'm, I'm attributing it to the lightweight, high reps. My body hadn't done it, so oh, I'm, now I stayed in that <laughs> for years later, and it wasn't again until I changed, changed that up again. Did I realize like it's the, the magic is not in how many reps you're doing; it's in once I once my body adapts to that rep range, moving out of that is the key. It's not so much the six reps, the ten reps, the fifteen to twenty reps. It's I've been following this rep range for more than four to six weeks by now, which is about the most you want to push a rep range, staying consistent with it before you move out of it. And the the real reason why I was growing had nothing to do with the heavy weight, the lightweight, the reps. It had to do with I was changing the stimulus and realized it took me another probably two or three years before I pieced this together and it really started to sharpen the way I was programming for myself and phasing in and out of the rep ranges. Yes, a, a weight um, and a rep range for an exercise is most valuable when it's uh, new or almost new. So what I mean by that is if you start training at a brand new rep range today, the most gains you're going to get from it are going to be the next few weeks. Okay. That's where you're going to get the most benefit. That same rep range become less and less valuable. The longer 
you've been doing it. So after a few weeks, if you stick to it long enough, after five weeks, six weeks, 10 weeks, you know, months, that rep range loses so much value. And this is true for all the rep ranges, including the heavy, heavy rep ranges. Now, what are the problems besides, you know, your body not progressing because you stay in a rep range for too long or a low rep range for too long? The other problem is this heavy resistance training with low reps really, really hard on the joints. It's just more that there's a greater risk on your joints than there is with lighter rep ranges. Well, this is why this is why they get the bad rap, right? This is what scares some people away is because they hear there's there's enough stories of someone hurting their back from lifting heavy squats or, you know, their knees are bad now because of all the heavy weight they lifted. So everyone's got a, a, a grandparent or a father that they've heard that story from, and that's what it comes from. It's not that the the heavy weight did it. It's the, more than likely a lot of those people that were training heavy were falling into this myth where they were always training like this, mm -hmm. and they weren't giving those they weren't giving the joints and ligaments some break from that heavy load all the time, and this can cause those those aches and pains that that are nagging for years later. And people think it had to do with just them lifting heavy weight. Well, no, the reality of it was they weren't taking care of their body and learning to phase and move out of it. Absolutely. So lifting heavy definitely has some value like you said adam uh there's some truth to it but the but it's not the be all end all and if it does become that for you you are going to severely hamper your ability to progress now the the, the next one is one that i uh it took me forever it took me forever to figure this one out this was probably in terms of training i would say the one that took me the longest to finally realize was full of crap. Yeah. Um, mm. And it's because this one is so ingrained in the resistance training world and the muscle building world. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's, it's ingrained in the athletic world. Oh, it's big time in, in, in sports too. Oh, all sports. And that's the no pain, no gain beast mode or that you need to train to failure in order to get your body to respond. I know. I remember the first time uh, I, I learned what failure was. It was real early on because it's one of the first things you learn. And what do they say? You know, Arnold says, you know, in pumping iron, for example, uh, it's the very last rep that causes, you know, the muscles to grow. The, that last rep that you can barely move. Um, Mike Menser wrote a whole book called Heavy Duty where he talked about going to failure as being the, the switch that signaled uh, muscles to grow. Um, you read about, you know, people who are training hard and working hard. And it's this very, you know, honorable thing to see people mm. push themselves to the absolute limit to where they can't move anymore. And there's a little bit of that, you know, bravado and a little bit of that celebration mm. around it. And, you know, here you are a guy and you want to work out and you want to earn mm -hmm. your muscle. And so you go to the gym and you're like, I'm going to force my body to grow. I'm going to force my body to change and mm. failure is as far as you could go. Failure literally means I'm lifting a weight until I can't lift it anymore, at least not with good form. Um, or, or as most people interpret it, can't lift it at all. There's nothing else beyond failure. Although there are things like forced reps and that kind of stuff, if you really want to get crazy, but failure is it, right? That's like the end of the road. So that must mean I've hit the target. Like if I go to failure, that means I've hit the switch and my body knows it better grow or I'm going to punish it again. Yeah. Well, talking about being honorable, and this is something that it's a mindset that it, it, that's why this myth is so hard to dispel for people because it's something that has benefited uh, multiple athletes in their mindset when they're competing. And this is something you're going to face all this adversity in life, right? And so it's to power through it and to sort of bear down and and, and overcome whatever's in front of you. I mean, this is a sentiment that everybody can kind of get behind right away. Uh, it, it's very motivating. It's very uh, sexy and flashy. And uh, it's something that has, you know, initially it works, right? Like being able to, uh, you know, test yourself past your limits. I mean, it's going to produce something. But how long is that really going to work for you? And people have a hard time, uh, you know, being able to think differently and to think, uh, you know, maybe my body, maybe there's a right dose for this that I can actually uh, apply to my body in a more effective way. And, you know, that's, that's a really hard sell for somebody that's been 
powering their way through these workouts. Well, apparently. at at the risk of what though, right? This is also a situation where, like you brought up earlier, about uh, form and technique. Uh, the problem when most people go to failure, they don't even fail correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, when they train to failure, they they push until their body can't move anymore, and long before that, or at least a rep or two before that, their form is already breaking down. And mo most people that are training are training to change their body aesthetically. There's obviously a, a portion of people that are here for performance, and those that are there for performance, I can make a case for occasionally training to failure for sure, For the just for the exact point that Justin made. But the average person who is trying to build and sculpt and shape a body through losing body fat and, and building muscle the most effective way possible, well, the, the moment that you stop utilizing the, the main muscle that you're trying to work at that point and you allow the rest of your body to jump in to help it, you kind of defeat the purpose of what you're really trying to accomplish in the gym mm -hmm. unless you're that athlete who is training mindset that day. Yeah. Unless your goal is I am trying to break through a mental plateau and I'm going to push myself to my limits. Sure, there's a place for that, but for the average gym goer who's trying to train, shape, and sculpt the body, uh, it really doesn't, it doesn't apply to this person. No, and you know, luckily, you know, recently, more recently, I'd say over the over the last five years, they've actually done studies comparing training to failure to not training to failure. Now, it is important to understand that, uh, you know, there is a level of intensity that you want to hit uh, when you work out, mm -hmm. um, but going to failure, studies show consistently now, is too much. Uh, it actually. Uh, produces less results, uh, less strength, and builds less muscle. So it's not even equal. Okay, now yeah. we're, how how hard should you work out? In, in my experience, stop about one to two reps before failure. Stop just short of that, and then watch what happens. And I remember the first time I did this, I was in my twenties. That's how long it took me. I was in my twenties, and I'm working out in my in my studio. And I, you know, I wanted, I was trying to train my body more frequently, but I, I just couldn't recover enough. And I thought to myself, you know what, I'm going to lower the intensity and just see what happens. You know, what the hell, I, I'm going to give it a week. And if, you know, if it doesn't work, I'll just go back to, you know, killing myself, you know, by going to failure. And I'll never forget, I didn't go to failure. The very next workout, I was stronger. And mm -hmm. then the very next workout, I was stronger again. That's all I did. All I did was go from train to failure on every single set to stopping about two reps short and my body responded like crazy. Now, the irony of this is I had been training clients already for at least seven years at this point. I almost never trained my clients to failure. Do you know why? Because the few times I did, they wouldn't progress. Mm -hmm. So I never trained my clients to failure, which is so funny. And if you're a trainer and you're listening, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We tend to train our clients better than we train ourselves mm -hmm. because we're more objective. And I never, almost never trained my clients to failure. It was just too much. For some reason, I thought that didn't apply to me. I thought, oh, well, the bodybuilding magazine say go to failure, so I'm just going to keep doing that. But the minute I stopped, my body started progressing. And again, the studies support this 100%. Every single time they do a study on this, they find that tra training to failure has almost little to no value and, in fact, actually – reduces uh, somebody's progress. Yeah. It's a, it actually will slow it down. Not to mention uh, about training clients this way. I remember, you know, scheduling the next session and, and what a, you know, what you had to overcome in terms of like the soreness and uh, you know, the, like what kind of performance they, they were able to apply in that workout. It was always like a, a lot more challenging to create a workout for them uh, after a really hammering to failure type leg day, uh, for instance. So uh, j just, you know, applying that, that, that concept of, of two, one to two reps short, uh, I myself found a lot of benefit just in terms of applying more frequency to my workouts and having more effective workouts going forward after that. Well, we, we, we see this science applied in the best programming in the world, which we've discussed before, and that's in powerlifting. I mean, when you, in, in powerlifting has some of the best pro – and Olympic lifting both. Both Olympic lifting and powerlifting have some of the best programming in the world when you look at the way they approach their programming, unlike any, anybody else. That they actually figure out a percentage of max that you should be training at, and you're supposed to you, – the whole program is designed – of never maxing out or never pushing yourself to absolute failure. That's where you peak. 
the idea is that you build up to this crescendo at the end where then you can go all out at a meet and lift the most weight you've ever lifted in your life before. But the training that leads up to that and the strength building and muscle building that leads up to that is all programming that's done short of failure. And the, right. the only difference that when, when we tell people, you know, leave two in the tank is it's just, it's, we've, this, we've left it that way for the average listener because very few people on here are going to figure out their one rep max and then multiply what 75% is and then figure out how many repetitions is that out of their 10 rep max. Like it's just much easier to coach to, Hey, leave two in the tank. If you know, if you know, you could have at least got another one or two stop right there. That's don't take it all the way to failure. That's our way of gauging people at the 75 to 85% intensity. It's just easier for the average person to consume that. But the benefits in it, like again, like I said, the, the science behind it that's applied and where we see it expressed the best is in both powerlifting and Olympic lifting. And it's it's one of those ones that, you know, it took me a while also to figure out. But again, uh, once I trained that way, uh, was another one of those paradigm shattering moments where the gain started to come on again. Totally. I, I, uh, you, you gotta remember that resistance training or exercise in general, it's a, it sends a signal, uh, that tells your body to adapt and your body. The reason why it adapts and, and gets stronger is so that the next time around the same, you know, insult, the same stress isn't causing the same amount of damage. So your body's literally trying to become more resilient towards the stressors. And this is true for every adaptation system in the body. And I've used this example before and I love it. It's like, you know, it's uh, when you go out to the sun and you expose your bare skin to the sun, the, the, the UV rays cause a little bit of damage. Your skin gets darker to try to adapt uh, to the sunlight so that you can stay out there for the same amount of time and not cause any damage. Now, what's going to give you a better tan? If I go outside and I sit in this to, in, under the sun to failure and let the sun just burn the shit out of me, or if I go out there, I expose myself to the right dose of sunlight, go back inside, and I repeat that the next day. Which one is going to produce better results? It's the same thing with resistance training. And failure is too much intensity for most people most of the time. Well, I wanna, something I, that you should use sparingly. I want to address all the intensity monsters that tout the studies that support training to failure too. And here, and this is what the audience needs to know. If you follow your favorite Instagram dude that, you know, is just a monster and lifts, looks like he lifts to failure every time he trains. And so you follow that and he touts all the studies that support the benefit muscle growth benefits from failure. The point that we're making right now that I think is so important is that I, I don't, re I don't recall a male client of mine that I ever trained that uh, was had a problem taking it to failure. Yeah, that that it's like it's yeah. built it's built in us men yeah. already to like Justin alluded to earlier, but the competitive side to us, the intensity, the overcoming adversity, like the warrior side comes out when you, and so it's very natural once you get any male into lifting that they naturally gravitate towards that. So. It's not that there isn't any sort of benefit to ever going to failure. It's that a majority of people, one, don't do it correctly, and then two, abuse it. And those people, which is almost everybody listening right now, would benefit far more greatly if they trained with two reps in the tank. That's right. And you know, you talked about intensity, so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna go with that one next because I think more broadly we can apply. Uh, you know, we could talk about the myth that uh, more is better. Mm -hmm. or that intensity is king. Um, this is another big one. And this is something that we tend to apply to a lot of things in life where we think, you know, if, if five is good, then 10 is better. You know? So if I, if I'm, my body's seeing good results right now and I'm doing, you know, 15 sets for my chest. Well, if I do 30 sets, then I'm going to double the progress. I'm going to speed things up mm -hmm. because I'm doing more. My body is going to respond faster. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's like medicine. Think about it this way, okay? Uh, you have, uh, you know, you take a prescription. You, you need some antibiotics, and you've got, you know, you're, you've got strep throat or something like that. So the doctor gives you antibiotics. Um, are you going to get better faster if you take five times the dose of antibiotics? Probably not. You're probably going to get really sick uh, and hurt yourself. There's definitely a right dose when it comes to exercise. And the right dose means you're going to get the best results from that. Not that it's the, the right dose because it's the least amount or the right dose because 
we're trying to save time. The right dose literally is the dose that will give you the most yeah. results, well, the fastest and that's, results. That's actually the science behind weightlifting. There is an actual science, anatomy and physiology. Everybody can acknowledge that as science, but the, the problem is, is – you know, there's no real like collective science that everybody like agrees upon in terms of lifting weights. It's a lot of it is uh, built off of like strength coaches for very specific populations or, you know, like bodybuilding. And it's all got sort of distorted uh, over the years. But really, there is a science to this. And, and this is something that if people really paid enough attention to this and really applied uh, these concepts correctly, the fact that there's uh, uh, the perfect dose for you intensity-wise, it's going to make a massive difference in your training. Well, to that point, this intensity is also what feeds the overtraining monster or, the reco or what we call the recovery trap, uh, which we've mentioned on this podcast many times. And and again, this was another area where that was paradigm shattering uh, for me through my lifting career. And uh, it, it was around, and it's perfect to follow this point up with the the failure training because it was this is when this started to come together for me. Obviously, if I was going two reps short of failure, I'm backing off of my intensity inside my workouts. What I had noticed right away was I wasn't getting as sore as much. And before that, I used to attribute my gains or my success in the gym based off of how sore I was in the next workout. And so that's where the, the intensity just fed right into that. Well, once I started to back off the failure training and back off the intensity, I started to realize I wasn't getting as sore anymore. But then what ended up happening was I started putting more gains on. And one of the things I noticed right away was when I'd go into my next workout the next day or two days later, I wouldn't be so damn sore mm -hmm. that it wouldn't hinder that workout. And so I'd feel fresh and be able to get after the weights. And so I was able to apply a, a higher intensity without it being a, a perceived as high because I was better recovered, if that makes sense. That makes total sense. And, you know, uh, I, I, this one really feeds into the, 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 the male ego. Um, I mean, I'm going to be quite honest. Like I would go to the gym with my cousins or my friends and you, you, I would lose sight, uh, com totally lose sight of the whole reason why I'm there. I mean, you got to ask yourself, why am I going to the gym in the first place? Am I going here to beat myself up and see how hard I can work out today? Is that the goal? Or is the goal to get my body to change and respond, get my body to move in a favorable direction? Okay, so if your goal is to go to the gym and just beat the crap out of yourself, well, that's easy. You don't need any exercise programming. You don't need special technique. Just go to the gym and go nuts. Um, and I used to do that. I'd go with my cousins to the gym and I just would go as hard as possible. Let's see how uh, you know, who can, who can get the, who can be the last person to throw up? Let's see who could be the first person or the last person to quit. And we would just go nuts and we would brag about it. And you'd have this whole like, yeah, you know, man, that strip set you did, you know, you dropped the weight. It was crazy. You know, I threw up afterwards. It was so good. Meanwhile, not progressing. Meanwhile, yeah. not building muscle, not getting stronger. And boy, that loses its luster real quick. Like it, it's, it's fun. Just maybe once or yourself twice. Up. Yeah. And, and, oh, yeah. yeah, and that turned into CrossFit. Yeah, it, it's it's <laughs> one of those things. It's just it won't go away because it's the competitive side of it. Like there's always this this tendency to try and marry the two things together: the competitive sports angle and the weightlifting angle. Uh, and and then you know there's this justification later. This is the best way to train in order to gain muscle and all this, and it just starts to to completely throw all the science out to the wayside. And that's why I give I give these type of modalities a hard time because I fell susceptible to this completely. I mean, I was I was the one in the gym lifting as much as I possibly could every single workout because my friend was right there trying to do the same thing to me. And it was yeah. back and forth and back and forth. And you know, and there's there, there's a point when you're younger where you can, you know, you're a little more resilient. You can bounce back and you can hammer yourself and you know, you can kind of come back, but I was just maintaining I was never progressing. I was just got to a point where I was nice and strong, but I, I, I was never as strong as I was once I gave myself proper rest and recovery and dropped my intensity down quite a bit. Well, I think this is I think this is really common and why I think you fell for this probably the longest, Justin, is because of your athletic background. Mm -hmm. And of all the places that I think 
that training this way, uh, this intensely, more often than not, has the most value is on like a football field. You know, when when so much of the game is that that the mental side of being mm-hmm. able to withstand the punishment and mentally persevere and push through. Right. Otherwise right. Flat. There's 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 a lot of carryover that way for athletes. And this is as a trainer, this is was the client that I always struggled with getting them to to back off the intensity because they had that athletic background, which was made it great for teaching form and technique and pushing them. But it was a, a monster to try to get them to back off the intensity and trust that, hey, listen, less may actually be more for us in this situation because of that athletic background. And so if you're listening right now and you're a current athlete, okay, there's some value to to training this way because there's some carryover to uh, the, the, the mental uh, discipline that it, it gives you by training this way. But if you're somebody who is an ex-athlete or not an athlete at all, then this doesn't apply to you. Well, I'll even say this. If you're an athlete and you want to train and test and push your mental capacity, do it on the field. Um, The gym should be relegated to getting your body to progress, respond, to get stronger, to correct muscle imbalances, prevent injury. The place you test yourself is on the field at practice. That's when you push. First off, if you're uh, playing football or you're a wrestler you want to push your mental capacity while doing the the sport itself, okay? Because you can build all kinds of mental toughness in the gym, um, but then go on the mat under a really strong wrestler, and totally, it's a totally, totally different. Totally different. Totally, totally different. So if you want to test your and train your mental – and your coaches are already doing this to you. I guarantee it. You, you don't need to do this to yourself even more. You're going to go out, you're going to practice, and they're going to beat the crap out of you, and part of what they're training is that mental capacity. Mm-hmm. But as far as the gym is concerned, Use weights for what they're they're best for, which is to make you stronger, make you more stable, prevent injury, and you got to do it the right way. Because if you push yourself on the field, and you push yourself in the gym at that extreme level, you're just asking for trouble, hundred percent. You remember uh, remember the interview that we did with Corey Schlesinger? I I, I love that there was communication. He, he him as the strength coach at that mm-hmm. time for Stanford, mm-hmm. and then the basketball coach, and you know they had all the great you know tech stuff that actually would. You know, measure their HRV and see their reps, All the their accumulated steps. stress for yeah, the day. and yeah. he would actually modify and adjust his his weightlifting based off of how hard they got pushed uh, inside their their practice. So, I mean, yeah. just to show you that the most elite athletes are onto this; they know this. It's the average yeah. gym goer or the average weekend warrior athlete that is still falling susceptible to this. And it's it's normally, like I said, the client that I had, it's the ex-athlete. They're in their 30s now, but they train like an athlete all the way into their 20s, and so they're still applying that mentality in their weightlifting now. It takes a long time. World-class coaches know this as fact, and they apply this to their athletes, and they preserve their athletes. Their, lo- their athletes have more longevity in their pursuits of being great. Uh, for longer, and so it just it takes a while to, to make its way down to the general population uh, to then adopt these concepts. But this is why we're bringing it up. Like the, there's a better way to do it, and if you guys listen and start applying these concepts, uh, you'll thank us. Right now, the the next one probably did the most damage to me than all the other ones that I can think of, and and that's the mentality that you have to eat big. Uh, to get big, that uh, if you're not gaining <laughs> yeah. muscle, all you got to do it's is It's the eat fun more. way to do it, for sure. Yeah. Uh, just, just eat more food. I don't know. know. It's or, it's only fun if you're the kid who, who like, is just the that's fact That's true. It could know. be a total chore. Yeah, that's, if you're a true. skinny man, I know Sal can relate to me on this one. Like, oh, yeah. I spent many of nights, you know, with, uh, uh, with two peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and an 800-calorie gainer shake and, like, you know, sucking it down and, like, looking at the second sandwich, like, I can't do this. So yeah. Yeah, the, it, it could definitely be miserable too trying to do that. And I know there's definitely kids out there or young adults out there that can relate to this that are struggling to build muscle and where they put all their energy and effort is just constantly just stuffing their face all the time. Uh, so I'm with you, Sal, on this. This was this was a tough one for me uh, to learn to get through. And more than likely, I'm probably paying for some of the internal uh, gut damage that right. I did from all those years of doing that. Oh, yeah. I remember hearing, you know, I, I and I heard this more than once. I still hear it today sometimes that there's no such thing as overtraining, only under eating. Yeah. Probably <laughs> the, the dumbest, most damaging 
myth that uh, you know, of all time because if you're like me was skinny and i'm not progressing well the answer is eat more food and i would i would literally force feed myself i would make shakes with chicken breast okay i blend <laughs> in the blender Yummy. with milk and eggs and all kinds of crazy stuff i would set the alarm to wake me up at 3 a.m so i could drink uh, a weight gainer i would i wouldn't even drink water throughout the day i would just drink milk and weight gainers try and gain weight. And what I ended up gaining was a lot of body fat. Now, there is some truth that, you know, you need to eat more calories than you're burning to build muscle. You need to give your body the, the building blocks to build muscle. But it's not as much as you think. Yeah. You don't need to yeah. pound 10,000 calories to gain uh, muscle. In fact, if you, if you have a pretty efficient body and you gain a pound of muscle in a week, which, by the way, is a lot, one pound of lean muscle in a week is, is really, really good. Yeah, it'd be but if you gain a pound of muscle in a week, that's maybe a grand total of an additional 300 calories total, total yeah. for the whole week. Divide that up over the, over seven days. And what are you looking at? Yeah, you know, it's nothing really. It's not that much. The key really is to send the right signal. Mm -hmm. If your body wants to build muscle, then it's going to build muscle. As long as you give it adequate amounts of food, if your body doesn't want to build muscle, you can feed it as much as you want. Nothing's going to happen. This remind you know what this reminds me of. This reminds me of uh, the old advice that uh, was given to women for I don't know. I think it was like a decade where, in order to to prevent osteoporosis, women were told to take a ton of calcium. Yeah. And what they found was that supplementing with all this calcium, they were actually getting calcium deposits in their arteries and increasing the risk of heart disease. And it wasn't doing anything to strengthen their bones. And the reason why it wasn't doing anything, although calcium is a very important component of strengthening bone, was that there was no signal to build bone. They, these women were sedentary. They weren't, you know, they weren't sending any signal to the body that says we need to get stronger bones. They're just providing the body with extra calcium and the extra calcium wasn't going anywhere. Well, you, if your workout isn't stimulating muscle growth and you're just force feeding yourself, you're just going to get fatter. You're not going to build any more muscle and maybe cause yourself some digestive issues like like I did with myself. Well, I was I was surprised in the competitive world how prevalent this still is. I mean, oh. this was one of the things after a couple shows, I realized that I was going to have an advantage because I recognized a lot of my peers that were doing show after show after show after show were bringing kind of the same physique. They could get lean, you know, they knew how to cut calories, get on cardio for days and restrict, right, and train hard and burn a bunch to get shredded to present a lean physique. But every time they came on stage, about the same weight, about the same amount of lean body mass, and they would go on these bulks uh, for, you know, six to 12 weeks, sometimes longer, and, you know, pack on 30 pounds, 40 pounds, uh, and then shred down for a show and then show up with the same physique. Yeah. And, it, and it, it's partly because – all those extra calories they were doing, uh, yeah, that was helping them put weight on. But unfortunately, their programming was so poor that it wasn't sending a signal to add any more muscle. You know, their, right. their body had already adapted to that training routine they've been doing. They'd fallen into some of the similar myths that we were talking about earlier, and their physiques weren't progressing. They were still Dude. they were getting shredded, and they were getting big and bulky, and then coming down. But they they weren't adding lean body mass. Uh, show over show or year over year. And I, that was a major advantage that uh, I had. And I didn't know I had that until I was recognizing the, the shows and the guys showing up to the same ones that I was at and pre presenting the same physique as the last time I'd seen them. I'll tell you a story that uh, I don't think I've ever told on the show. It was hilarious. At one point uh, in my 20s, you know, I'd been working out for a while. I, I was 200 pounds at about 10% body fat, which is not bad. You know, I, I don't have a huge frame, pretty muscular. That puts my lean body mass at about 180 pounds. And I remember I, I read some stupid article where, you know, they hammered this home, you know, eat big or go home. You know, you, there's no such thing as overtraining, just under eating. And, you know, you, in order to get big, you got to eat like, a, you know, like eat as big, eat as big as you want to be type of deal. So I, I, I'll never forget this statement. Uh, if I want to look, I'll never forget this trainer telling me this. I was 21 years old looking at what well, I think the second gym membership I ever got at Gold's Gym. 
and me and my little skinny basketball best friend sitting down and he this guy big old steroided guy walks over says if you want to look like a bull you got to eat like a bull <laughs> <laughs> that's for, wisdom that's forever yeah. fucking that was cemented in my brain bro for the next 10 years and i <laughs> Dude, i'll never like, forget oh, it man <laughs> Well, you'll love this, right? Oh, so I'm in, eat. again, I'm, I'm in my early 20s and I'm 200 pounds, 10% body fat, which is pretty, you know, pretty good. I've been working out for a while or whatever. I'm pretty strong. And I'm like, okay, that's it. I'm on a mission now. That's it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just going to eat all the time. Like I'm just going to eat tons of calories. I'm going to put on muscle. And I did. And I got my weight up to 220 pounds. I gained 20 pounds on the scale. And I was so proud of myself that I gained 20 pounds, right? So then I call over one of my trainers that work for me and I'm like, hey, you know, uh, can I do a body fat percentage <laughs> test? I want to see how much lean body mass I gained. You know how much lean body mass I gained? Like hardly anything. One pound. Yeah. yeah. I gained one, one pound. <laughs> my body fat went from 10% to All 18%. Fat. I gained 20 pounds and I gained one. And you know how it is with, with the caliper. That could have been one pound of poop or, or water in <laughs> yeah. my body. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember thinking, oh my God, I stuffed my face. I lost my abs and I gained body fat this entire time. I gained body fat. So now <laughs> yeah. I'm going to cut down what it was such a, uh, and, an and, eye opener. And why this is so, and for the guys that are are going to let this go in one ear and out the other, why this is, is, is going to screw you too is when you put on 20 to 30 pounds in the winter bulk or whatever kind of bulk you're running, and then you go back the other direction. When you run a cut for a long period of time, if you've only, if you've put twenty, like your example, you put twenty pounds on one pound of it being muscle, nineteen pounds being a fat. Now to lose that twenty pound, lose that nineteen pounds of fat, you got to stay in a calorie deficit and 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 burn more. Your body will end up paring down probably at least a pound or two muscle in the way. You, you just got to uh, account for that. Like when I used to bulk and I'd put on some lean mass, I knew that when I got cut for a show that it was inevitable I was probably going to still lose a pound or two of muscle on the way down. I mean, it's that close of a science, and the leaner you get, the harder it is for you to retain that muscle. So I always had to account that I'm probably going to still lose a pound or two. So if you spent you know a whole winter bulking to get 20 pounds on and you only really added one or two pounds of muscle, and then you go to cut that fat off, you end up losing. <laughs> you lose it yeah. all the fat you put on. Yeah, so. you, end, you end up in a worse position yeah. than what you were before you even started the bulk. Yeah, you, you just become an expert at gaining and losing fat, but you haven't <laughs> yeah. said anything yeah. <laughs> yeah. for muscle. You know, you know, I got a. Uh, I, I'll tell you another story for the next one that, um, uh, you know, was. It took. It was really hard for me to accept this one as truth until I saw it. Uh, you know, uh, applied to about a few people. So at one point, you know, I, I was managing big box gyms. I decided to leave. So I go down to the Palm Springs area and I buy you know, uh, some ownership of a gym with my partner. So now we're down Southern California, whatever. I got all these trainers working for me. I recruited the sales guy that used to work for me at 24 fitness. I'm not going to say his name. And so they started working for me. Now I had this trainer that, you know, cause Palm deserts down in, in Palm Springs and Palm desert areas down by, you know, Mexico. I had this trainer that would drive down to Mexico and come back with like all these steroids. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, and he, so we had all this access to anabolic steroids where the sales guy that worked for me, I had known him for a while. He'd been lifting weights for a long time. Uh, nothing impressive. Didn't really have that much of an impressive physique. His workouts were crap. His diet was crap, but whatever. And he's like, oh man, finally, I'm going to be able to do my first cycle of, uh, you know, of steroids. And I remember he bought, you know, like testosterone and you know, this, this veterinary version of like DECA and all these injectable steroids. And he's like, Oh, this is going to be crazy. And I remember thinking I was jealous. And I remember thinking like, Oh, this guy's going to look, he's going to look like a pro bodybuilder in like 12 weeks. Like this is going to be crazy. And I remember him taking all these steroids and he, he did get stronger in the gym, but his body barely changed. His workouts were still shitty. He still had a shitty diet. He didn't really change it. You know what it looked like? It looked like he took maybe creatine and kind of got a little bloated and he was stronger in the gym, lost a little bit of hair, got some acne. And it was like, <laughs> yeah. what the hell's going on? Is it, and I remember another trainer did the same thing. He went on and he went on a crazy cycle and he gained like five pounds of muscle, which isn't that much. And that brings me to this, this next myth that you're going to, you know, if you took steroids, 
you're just going to automatically, oh, just yeah. like like magic. It, it's like a guarantee. This one stings for me a little bit. <laughs> this, one, this, this, one's, this one's close to home for me a lot uh, because not only did uh, did I learn the hard way, um, but I, I've also probably done uh, some serious damage. Well, I know I've done damage to uh, my natural testosterone levels because of this and uh, you know, forever have been you know working towards bringing those up naturally. And- this was in my early 20s. I got to be maybe 23 at this time and I'm struggling, skinny kid, still trying to build muscle. Already been lifting at this point about four years. And um, I try, I'm a trainer by this time. And there's a, a massive bodybuilder guy that's a trainer with me. And uh, he, he looks phenomenal. And I look to him for advice, and he basically tells me, "Oh, you got you got to get some juice. You know, you got to run some steroids. That's what you have to do, <laughs> right?" I mean, and at that and that point, it was very easy to convince me that that's what was missing, right? That's a, I at that point in my my trainer career, you know, I had some certifications under my belt. I've got some years of experience of lifting. I got some years experience teaching. Uh, I think I know it all, and I am I. 100% believe at this time in, in my career that the difference between the guys on the covers of Muscle Magazine or Men's Health even uh, and me are that they have steroids and I don't. You know, Other than that, I've got everything else I thought dialed. And I was completely wrong. And I remember the, the stack that he put me on. It was uh, Equipoise, uh, Cessanon, and Test. And, and, and it was like a 900-something dollar. It was a, a bunch of money. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I let him write my whole stack and and cycle for me, and I I follow it like an idiot. And I'll I mean I'll, I'll I was the strongest I'd ever been. I mean every, every time I went to the gym, I was I was stronger and stronger and stronger. But I was also getting skinnier. I was getting leaner, and I couldn't figure it out. Like I just could not put on any weight. I wasn't putting any weight on. I was only getting stronger. And I remember at the end of this whole entire cycle, I think I put a total of about five pounds on, which was probably mostly water because as soon as I came off of it, I went right back to where I was before. And that just devastated me because uh, like I've had, we've had many kids probably ask us this on the show before about, you know, what if I just run one cycle? You know, if I run one cycle to help me put on my, mu- put on some muscle mass and then I'll go back to being natural forever to that, like, can I keep that muscle? And that was kind of my idea I was like, okay, I don't really want to do steroids, but I- I'm going to need, I need to do it to get to a certain muscle mass size and then I'll, I'll be natural from there. And it was one of the most deflating uh, situations for me ever in my lifting career was to take all this stuff, to feel strong as an ox in a gym while I was on it. But then at the end of all of it, I didn't add any more muscle onto my body. And that was infuriating. Oh, totally. And and I want to be clear, steroids definitely have an effect. It definitely can work, but by themselves, they don't do a lot. Mm. Uh, You're going to notice an increase in libido, oilier skin, some hair loss, maybe some increases in strength, but it's not going to do much if it's not paired with an excellent workout routine Mm -hmm. and a good diet. If you have a shitty workout routine and you go on steroids, you're not going to get much out of them. They're not a miracle drug where you just take them and then you blow up. And the guys that you see that are massive, lots and lots of muscle who are on steroids, they've been taking steroids for a very, very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And they've been following, you know, good routines for very, very long times. It is not a. It is absolutely not a guarantee for muscle. And I, I remember watching my buddy go on the cycle, and you know, I thought, oh, he's going to pass me up or whatever. Didn't even come close. And I remember thinking, this is terrible. Like, what's going on here? Yeah, what's the point it's, at that point? Yeah, right? w- w- like, what's the whole point behind uh, all of this stuff? You know, there was that one video, that one TED talk that we saw, where that uh, that 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 guy was breaking down how athletes have. Oh, over yeah. the years broken records and the, how we all think it's due to steroids and he really broke it, sports yeah he really mm-hmm. broke it down to the fact that athletes are just you know there's there's the democratization of it where uh, we, we rather than looking for a general athlete now we look for an athlete that's specifically good for particular sports and the technology of the equipment the track the shoes the bike that kind of stuff really is, is attributed to most of the of the progress what you see at the top of the of the you know the food chain when it comes to athletes are hard training, very consistent, um, and extreme genetic anomalies. These people are are just genetic freaks. 
It's not the steroids. You could take all the steroids in the world. Mm. And if you're just a regular person, you'll be nowhere near uh, what a professional athlete would be like or a professional body. I could take all the steroids in the world and I wouldn't even come close to, you know, Ronnie Coleman or Phil Heath right. or any yeah. of those guys. You got to factor at genetics, all. all kinds of other factors in there. Uh, but I mean, it still does have a very potent effect, uh, like, uh, beyond the fact that, um, you know, it's not like you're going to take it and nothing's going to happen. I mean, the, this is why it's a banned substance in sports. It's something that right. is actually proven, you know, to, uh, you know, help enhance uh, the muscle building process, it, but it has to be done right. Oh, no, it's amazing how much it has to be done. Right. Uh, it, what, you know, that one time wasn't the last time I did a cycle <laughs> I've, I did many cycles after that, uh, attempting to uh, apply new methods, thinking that, oh, it's, and, and of course, I did what probably a lot of people do in this path of, oh, it must have been the stack I took. You know, I should, I should try something else, you know? So, you know, cycling through all the different types of testosterones and, you know, amounts that I was doing. I mean, I, I then began trying to troubleshoot and figure that out. And that must have been the reason why. And the reality of it was I just wasn't there yet. I wasn't. I wasn't there yet in my programming. I wasn't there yet on my nutrition. And I thought so. That's the that's the crazy part. And I think why I'm so passionate about having conversations like this is th this was my career. I'm working towards being a personal trainer. I'm studying. I have the certifications. I'm teaching other people. I'm supposed to be very knowledgeable in this area. I think I know a lot or know it all at this point. And yet this is an area that I was completely wrong and didn't realize how much more had to do with genetics, diet, and programming. And yeah, if genetics, diet, and programming in place and you throw steroids on that, oh my God. Well, that's what you see when you see a professional bodybuilder or guys that look like this or look like they could be a professional bodybuilder even if they don't do it. Those guys have figured out all of those other things in, in, in addition to the steroids. It wasn't the steroids that made them look like that. And I think that's a, a major myth that a lot of people think, and I fell for early on, was, oh, I just need that, and then that's mm -hmm. going to take me there. It's not that magical. It yeah. is not at all. No, you take the average person, you put them on steroids, and they're going to be like, what? It's not like, this, is, this isn't what I thought it would be uh, at all. No. Um, now, that takes me to the next one, which uh, this one's a tough one to, to explain because instinctually, it seems like it would be totally true. Um, this is the myth that the biggest strongest uh most muscular guy in the gym must know the most they must know all the right information mm -hmm. and that's the person that you need to go to for advice on training and this you know i get it it's intuitive you know if you want to you want to you know figure something out you want to ask somebody it looks like they've figured it out um themselves and you know when when you're a big muscular guy in the gym you look like you know what you're talking about obviously i mean look at the guy's arms and legs and look how strong they are mm -hmm. that person really knows uh, what they're talking about um sometimes that's true a lot of times it's not oftentimes the biggest guy in the gym knows the least uh when it comes to training because oftentimes the biggest guy in the gym was born the biggest guy in the gym <laughs> yeah right yeah. you know it's like the guy with, just, it's like it's like the guy with the big calves who never did the calf raises <laughs> yeah that's just unfair. the guy with the biggest calf <laughs> is always the guy that was born with them for sure but <laughs> I mean, this one's, this one's totally true. Like, uh, I remember, you know, I, I'd have trainers that work for me in the gyms. I remember this one guy that worked for me, his porter. Uh, he wasn't even a trainer. And the dude's arms were 18 inches, uh, you know, super skull crushers with 225. He put two plates on a barbell and do skull crushers. And I'd watch this guy work out, and his workouts were crap. He would just go do random exercises and sets. And then I'd watch his diet, and he would have, like, Two, he, he didn't make a lot of money, so he would have like two cheeseburgers for lunch. He'd come in, have a pop tart. He'd have a cup of noodle, you know, for dinner. And I remember thinking, like, what the, you know? And it would it really what it was? I mean, his brother was uh, a D one football player. Really, what it was was this guy had insane muscle building genetics. I mean, he, with his crappy training and diet, he he was far beyond what I was with everything being perfectly dialed in. He didn't have a lot of great information. He just had uh, exceptions. His, his parents give him all the information that he needed with his genetics. Yeah, right. Yeah. I think we I think we see examples of this all over like social media. 
Oh, yeah. uh, you know, the, the most popular people are, are in the in the fitness community are the are the super buff, incredible, and both this is male and female that have these incredible uh, physiques, and not to take credit from them like they don't work hard in the gym, but a lot of them uh, could have almost done anything in the gym and would have looked really good. There's just some people that were meant to lift weights. They have a very what you know the their somatotype, the mesomorph, like where. You know, they, they put on muscle pretty easy. They can lose body fat relatively easy. Uh, and they just, they were built to build muscle. They, they touch a weight and, and we've all had these clients. If you're a trainer and you're listening, you know, you've had clients that are just hyper responders. You know, they, you, you put them on a routine and like week over week, they're just seeing gains and change. And it's, it's amazing. And you know, those, those, those guys in the gym that have those incredible physiques, a lot of times, uh, this is it. Or, They've just figured out what works really well for them, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, and, and for them, you know, eating this certain way and training at this time and this hard and following this type of a, a workout program has just built the best physique for them ever. And they've been and, and what we've talked about and we haven't addressed today of, of all the things that are important, uh, consistency is going to win over everything. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we, we've taught Sal. You've said this many times. A, a what is it? A inferior program will is superior when done consistently, right? Yeah, uh, it's better than better, better than better programming when it's done consistently. Yeah. So if you know, a lot of times those physiques just speak to their consistency. You know, they've been yeah, lifting yeah. for twenty years in the gym, and they're like, "Yeah, I've had three days off." Mm-hmm. You know, and so yeah, yeah they, they have these great physiques. But does that mean that the advice or the information that they have for you and what you're trying to do, more often than not, it's it's not going to apply to that person because most people that are average uh, body types and they're trying to work towards their goal have totally different problems or issues with seeing their results than that guy has ever had in his life. Yeah, and it's no, you're one hundred percent right. There's there's such a big uh, variance between individuals in terms of what is the right dose, uh, what is the right exercises, how to apply the right exercises, what's the right diet, what types of foods they should eat. Very different from person to person. This is why the people with the best, uh, most valuable information for you are people who have experience working with a wide variety of people. That's where you want to get your information. You want to get your information from the, the guy or girl who's trained you know, a hundred everyday people or people that are a lot like you because they have experience working with so many different individuals that they're going to be able to give you and provide you the best information. One of the, the, the number one lessons you learn as a personal trainer is that, uh, you know, not everything works for some people and for other people, it doesn't work at all. And so you, you train one person and a routine and application of diet and whatever mm. works exceptionally well then you apply it to the next person it's terrible i feel like uh, half of personal training is detective work and really it's 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 being able to tune in to what they respond to the best based off of uh every workout every uh week after that of like what they've been eating and how we can adjust and tweak and modify things and the the closer you get to honing into that frequency uh that that very specific uh blueprint for that one person uh that's when they really take off and unfortunately you don't really get that right away uh when, when you get that right away they tend to be those hyper responders. They tend to be those kinds of people that uh, you can kind of almost throw anything at, and they're going to uh, start getting muscle. But uh, for the for the average person, it it tends to be, in my experience, it takes a lot more time to to, to unlock that. Now, totally. the The last one is, I would say, and I'm glad we left it last because I would say that this one is the most recent uh, for me. Uh, and, and I think that, I think that just has a lot to do with youth. Uh, and when you're young, you are more resilient and can get away with more shit. And, uh, I avoided, uh, the, you know, exercises that were, you know, deemed woman's exercises. And that encompasses everything from hip thrusts to lunges to, you know, mobility work, yoga, stretching, (laughs) all the things that as a young you know, testosterone filled boy who wants to build muscle had no, I didn't have time for that shit. Yeah. Uh, it's and, too feminine for me. And that, and that probably stuck with me, uh, 
through most all of my 20s, and it probably wasn't until I was closer to 30 and had already had uh, knee surgery uh, and, you know, the aches and pains were starting to creep up. And I think that's what originally drove me in this direction uh, to start, okay, digging a little deeper into these 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 tedious, what I thought were girly movements uh, that I wasn't doing and uh, started applying that. But again, like everything else that we keep talking about, uh, once I did, the carryover that I saw into my physique, into how I felt, my strength, my overall energy in the gym, everything improved when I threw out that myth. Yeah. It's so funny to me because, you know, uh, as guys, we can sometimes be predictable, right? So we'll think something is, you know, uh, oh, that's for girls or that's for women. You know, I'm not going to do that. It's not, it has no value. And then uh, uh, some like, you know, superhero guy or strong dude does it. And then all of a sudden all the guys think it's okay now. Like I'll give you yeah. a couple of examples. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? You, you know, you know seven time Mr. Olympia. Um, and in bodybuilding, posing is a big part of competition, your ability to present your body. Well, he signed up for ballet, uh, ballet classes. Yeah. And you, you can yeah. actually see this in, in pumping iron. And every bodybuilder after that did it. <laughs> every bodybuilder after that. All of a sudden, everybody's Whoa, going man. to ballet classes to learn uh, how to be a better poser. I'll, I'll give you another example. When I first started working out, lunges was considered a female exercise. Like there wasn't a, I, I don't know, a single guy that would do a lunge. A lunge was a sculpting exercise. Oh, don't waste your time on that. That's so stupid, whatever. Well, fast forward, Ronnie Coleman doing walking lunges in the parking lot of the, you know, the gym that he would work out in Texas. And of course, Ronnie Coleman had the most insane looking legs and glutes. And he was, you know, the, the, the winning it most winningest bodybuilder or Mr. Olympia of all time. Next thing you know, I'm seeing dudes do walking lunges <laughs> All over the place. Now, all of a sudden, it's this amazing, phenomenal, mass-building, muscle-building exercise. The funny thing is split-stance squats and lunges have been done by weightlifters forever. Yeah. Weightlifters who are, who are hoisting 500 pounds above their head have been doing that exercise forever. Uh, but, you know, nobody was paying attention to them. As soon as Ronnie Coleman does it, all of a sudden, it's, oh, that's not girly anymore. <laughs> you know, that's something that we, we should all do. It's so silly to me. Um, you know, I, I, in my opinion, uh, the real... One of the real marks of, uh, of, of, you know, when people say, what does it mean to be a man or what does it mean? Whatever. It's not being afraid to try do new things and to see if it works and not care what the what everybody else thinks. And here's the thing. Yeah. Yoga, mobility work, um, you know, those things have tremendous value for everybody. I don't care if you're a male or female. If your goal is to build muscle, if your goal is to improve your physique and your fitness, then you better do those mobility movements, those exercises that, you know, maybe don't seem as cool because the carryover is absolutely massive. So to me, this one's, a, 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 it's just so funny to me. It's like it's, yeah. exercises don't have a gender, you know? It's funny, dude. It, and I, I could totally take myself back to when I was playing sports and when I was like trying to be Mr. Tough, cool guy. Uh, it, you never wanted to admit when you're hurt either, right? Like this is a problem too. I think a lot of men's like, don't want to go to the doctor. They don't want to get checked up. They don't want to like. You don't want to have somebody assess like your weaknesses or, uh, you know, something that uh, I can work on that looks silly that will actually make everything perform better. Uh, if, if it looks silly, like as you just like ignore it and and it, it's this sort of I can work through the pain. It's just going to kind of take care of itself. This is a kind of a mentality. A lot of me and my friends shared growing up. And so, uh, you know, taking that into training was just naturally like, well, if I have a shoulder pain or whatever, maybe I'll just lighten the weight for a bit, but it's going to work itself out. It's going to work its way out. And it took me a <laughs> long time to really like put my ego aside and start really understanding that, oh, wow, when I actually put attention to really good solid priming type warm up before i get to heavy lifting it makes a massive difference in performance i feel stable i feel connected i feel so many more uh improvements when i'm actually lifting heavy weight so if i i started to look at it more as a performance enhancement as opposed to like i'm trying to mend something that's weak or failing well the, the irony uh sal you said it right? the exercise uh, doesn't know uh, the difference between gender and the irony of this is that men 
will, would benefit from this probably more than most of my women clients. Mm-hmm. If I if I look back at all the different people that I train, and I separate men and women, and and we're talking about flexibility and mobility, uh, and having good range of motion, my men were far more limited than most of my women when I first got them. Yep. So the irony of this point is that, you know, yeah, it doesn't know the difference in gender, but I'll tell you right now that most men listening are going to probably benefit from this advice more than even women would just simply 100%. because because most most men are stubborn, most men are falling into the other myths, lifting heavy, shortened range of motion up, tight low backs, tight hips, and they got all this all this shit going on and like Justin was saying, don't want to go to the doctor, don't want to tell anybody about it, want to just work through the pain, and really what it is is they they've got Uh, mobility issues, joint mobility issues that they need to address. And if they would really just take the time to do these boring ass little exercises to get you primed and ready to go before you lift, you would then see what a difference it makes in your overall relief of pain, your overall strength, your ability to, to move through a greater range of motion, which then in turn builds more muscle. Like the benefits are, are tremendous but it's one of those things again. This of all the things we've talked about, this one took the longest for me, uh, and yep. pr- probably because of the stubbornness and you know, th- there's a, there's not a bunch of science and research to say that doing mobility exercises will build more muscle than lifting six reps or twelve reps or intensity or all the other things that we send to we tend to focus on. But what I didn't realize was how much my lack of mobility was really hindering my overall performance and results. And it wasn't until I started to apply that and see the carryover from applying that that I really just was mind blowing for me. Yeah, totally. Uh, there are no you know male or female exercises or techniques. There are some that are better than others. And then there are ones that are right for you and ones that are not right for you. And that's it. That's the bottom line. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com, download all of our guides, resources, and books. They're all totally free. You can also find your three favorite podcast hosts of all time on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.